Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today I would like to start a new chapter uh, of this course, which is called Physics for Teens. It's presented on unizor.com. Um, that's where all my lectures are, including the prerequisite for this course, which is Math for Teens. And um, I do recommend you to use the unizor.com as an entrance point because it actually contains the course rather than individual lectures. All individual lectures are included in this course and they are stored on YouTube, which you might have found this particular lecture. But I do encourage you to go to unizor.com and take the course actually from the beginning. It's in logical sequence and every lecture is supplemented with very detailed uh, textual uh, explanation of everything. Uh, plus, the course includes uh, different problems to solve and even examinations. Um, the site is completely free, there are no advertisements at all, and you don't even have to sign in. I mean, if you do, you, you, it, it's fine, but if you don't, you have exactly the same um, material to learn. So, uh, kinetic energy. That's my first lecture in the chapter called Energy. Well, obviously, as uh, the person with mathematical background, I would like to start with the definition of what we are talking about. So, what is the kinetic energy? Well, in many cases, uh, you can find an explanation that this is uh, an, an energy of motion or something like this, which is kind of true. But again, being from the mathematical background, I cannot define a term called kinetic energy using the word energy, which is not defined. So, I'm not going to define energy as a general right now. I'm talking about kinetic energy only. And um, I would like to, to, to define it. I was actually thinking about how to define it more or less, um, uh, uh, I would say, strongly and strictly and logically. So, um, I define it as follows. That kinetic energy is a quantitative characteristic of an object in motion. So we know what the object is, we know what the motion is, and so we are talking about certain quantity, quantitative uh, characteristic associated with this motion. Now, uh, what's important is that this particular quantitative characteristic, um, it indicates certain, that certain emotion, uh, a certain amount of work can be done if this particular object in motion interacts with other. So, this amount of work actually depends on the object in motion more than uh, on other objects which it interacts with. And I'm going to explain what it is. So, basically, kinetic energy is an ability of the object in motion to do some work, to perform some work, when this object interacts with other objects. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start with a very simple example. I have an object in motion which has mass and speed, and we consider it's a uniform motion along a straight line. And uh, let's assume that I have one particular um, constant force acting against this motion along the same trajectory. So this is our object. It moves this way, mass m, speed um, v, and now let's consider it's um, there. There is a force which acts exactly against this motion, and it tries to obviously to slow it down. Now, force will do certain amount of work when it slows down this object from the initial speed v to, init to, to, to ending speed zero, right? So I would like to find out what is the amount of work f which is needed to stop this object. Now, what is the source of the f? Uh, well, it can be, for instance, air resistance or friction or, I don't know, some kind of a spring or whatever when it actually hits the spring when like, for instance, in uh, some, some cars, they have an ending point, uh, and then they go this way and then go back along the same route. They sometimes have a spring which basically stops them. <coughs> uh, 
So, whatever the force is, it actually represents certain interaction of this object with something. But this is the simplest form of interaction. Just the constant force acting against the motion. So, how can I find out the work which this particular force actually is doing? Well, this is um, a product of this force times the distance it acts. So I have to find the distance. I know that we have initial speed v. We know the ending speed is zero. So there is a deceleration and I know the formula. This is the formula of a distance. If the object um, is uh, changing its speed with acceleration a during the time t, then um, that basically represents that particular distance which this object covers. So it's uh, basically the same formula as if you are going from the speed zero to certain maximum speed achieved using this acceleration and this time or vice versa if it has certain speed in the beginning can be decelerated down to zero so the formula is exactly the same so in one case a would be positive another is negative so right now we just disregard this particular sign and we assume that this is just a positive constant and that represents the distance so i have to find this constant well i know that uh, a is related to force and mass as this is a consequence from the second Newton's law, right? F is equal to mass times acceleration. That's a Newton's second law. So that's why we can find acceleration. So acceleration I know. How about the time? Well, that's also relatively easy. If you have on one end uh, the speed is equal to zero. This is V end and V begin equals to V. So during the time T I have this acceleration which I know nowadays, right, since I have determined it and we know that V begin is equal to A times T, right? Oh, sorry, yes, yes, that, that's exactly what it is. Um, when we are decelerating from this down to this, this is basically the uh, plain kinematics uh, equation for the speed after uh, e uh, acceleration, or in this case it's deceleration actually. So, from this I can find t. It's equal to v, which is the beginning speed divided by a. Now a, I know what it is. It's f divided by m, so m goes to the top. So this is my time. So I know acceleration. I know the time. Now I can find the distance. The distance is equal to a, which is uh, f divided by m times t square, which is v square m square divided by f square and divided by 2 which is equal to m f so it's m v square divided by 2 f so what's my work work is equal to f times s the force times the distance so if I were multiplied by f that would be mv squared divided by 2. So, that's actually quite a remarkable result. Look at this formula, what it depends on. It depends on mass and the initial speed of my object. It does not depend on force f. This is what's remarkable about it. It means that no matter what kind of resistance um, this particular moving object uh, faces, the work which that force of resistance actually should spend, should perform to slow down uh, my motion to, to zero, basically, is independent on the force itself. 
Now, if you have a strong force, it will have, you see, it's in denominator. The strong force will have a shorter distance. The weaker force will have a longer distance, but the work will still be exactly the same. So my, my point is that this work, which basically is something which um, kind of performed by um, outside force relative to the motion of the object, really is completely um, irrelevant in this particular case. There is certain quantitative characteristic of motion, which is this one, and I call it kinetic energy. So this kinetic energy, this is the definition basically of, of the kinetic e energy of the moving uh, object of mass m with uh, uniform speed v. This is certain amount of um, future work, if you wish, that anybody who wants to basically stop this motion should perform. No matter how you stop this, impo uh, th this motion, you will still have to perform this amount of work, which depends only on the moving object. So that's extremely important part of this. Kinetic energy of the moving object depends only on this object and its motion. It does not depend on anything which resists this motion. No matter how you resist, the amount of work will be exactly the same. That's why it's very important to understand that kinetic energy of the object, again, is characteristic of the ob object and its motion. It's independent of any outside forces. And this is basically the formula which kind of justifies my initial definition that kinetic energy is a quantitative characteristic of the object in motion. It's a very mechanical kind of thing we are talking about velocity or speed or whatever, so it's mechanics. So it, it's a characteristic only of the object in motion. It's not a characteristic of anything outside of this object, though the work which is needed obviously depends on objects which interact with this object. Okay, fine. So this is something which is um, basically a very, very obvious thing, what it is. Now, let's consider a slightly more difficult situation. Very, very slightly. For instance, we are not stopping an object. We just slow it down. But again, we are slowing down our object from speed V which is beginning speed, down to speed V end. Now, if my definition of the kinetic energy is correct, then there is certain amount of kinetic energy in the moving object when it moves with the speed V, and there is a certain amount of kinetic energy which is associated with the ending speed the end. Now, if I would like to slow down the object from this speed to this speed, I have to spend certain amount of energy. The same as in the previous example, I spend certain amount of energy to decelerate the object from some speed v down to zero. Now I'm just decelerating the, to, 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 um, uh, to the value of the, uh, of the speed v end. Now, if again the kinetic energy is a characteristic of the object in motion. It means there is a certain amount of kinetic en energy in the beginning. There is a certain amount of kinetic en energy which still remains in the object when its speed has been decelerated to, to this value, which is not equal to zero in this particular case. So the difference between these two must be equal to the work which needed to be spent to do this, right? So, I will basically do very, very similar um, uh, calculations and I will find the amount of work um, uh, based on whatever the force F is and eventually I should come up with the formula that this amount of work 
should be equal to a difference between beginning and ending kinetic energy of the moving object, right? I mean, if my definition is correct, if kinetic energy is really a characteristic of the object in motion, then this is the amount of kinetic energy I have, which means potentially it performs certain work, uh, it needs to be performed certain work to, to slow it down, let's say, to zero. But I still have this, so I don't really need all the amount of work, I only need the amount of work to slow it down to zero, to, 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 to the end. So the difference between them must be equal to the work. Well, let's check it out. A. <coughs> now, F is uh, the same thing, so it's uh, F divided by M, right? Now, the T, again, we know that uh, V end is equal to V beginning, which is our speed V, plus acceleration T. This is the general formula of uh, kinematics. <coughs> now, we are, um, we, we would like to have an absolute value of deceleration, which means, uh, uh, so I, I'll just consider it positive, but doesn't really matter. So the T is equal to um, the difference between the speed divided by acceleration, right? So my speed, whichever is be, uh, bigger is V. So it's V minus V end divided by acceleration, which is this. So that's my formula for T. And formula for S is um, um, not exactly this one. Formula for S would be in this particular case, since we are decelerating, it would be V times T minus A T square over two. In this case, I assume that A is actually positive. Otherwise, I would check, I, I would have to put plus and consider A is negative. Doesn't really matter. So that just change the the order of this. So we are uh, subtracting from bigger uh, to smaller and that's why A is positive, that's why I put minus here. So this is the formula. So let's just basically do some elementary calculations here. Don't need this. Don't need this. Don't need this. And let's see what happens. So, S is equal V times T, which is this one. V minus V end times M divided by F. Minus A T square over 2. Now, A again, A is my F over M. Now, divided by 2 means here. And now T square, which is this square, which is um, V minus V end square times M square divided by M square, right? Hope I'm right. So what happens here is this. This goes out and this goes out. Now, we got this. So, what do we have? <coughs> we have M times V times V minus V end minus again M divided by 2 V minus V end square. And the whole thing should be divided by F. This is S. Well, first of all, you immediately see that F times S already independent of, of the force, right? This is my work. So we kind of, all, all we have to do that we will have something like this if I will open all the parentheses, right? So what happens here is the following. Um, so Let's put W, which is work, which is equal to S times F. It's equal to um, 
let me put m over 2 outside of the parentheses. So I will have 2 v square minus 2 v v end minus v square plus 2 v v end minus v end square. So what we have is this goes against this, this and this are out, and what do I have? I have m over 2 v square minus v n square, which is exactly what this actually is. So as we see, to slow down from one speed to another and moving object of the mass m, again, it's it's just exactly the same amount of work which is needed by this force F, regardless of the force F. Again, the shorter or longer distance will be with uh, stronger or, or weaker forces, but their product, F times S, the work which is supposed to be done, is exactly the same. Which means that we have this certain amount of kinetic energy in the beginning, and when we spend certain amount of work to slow down, well, the kinetic energy is diminishing to the ending value, but the difference between kinetic energy in the beginning and kinetic energy at the end is equal exactly to the amount of work which our resisting force is supposed to spend, regardless of what this resisting force is, which proves again that our kinetic energy is characteristic of the object in motion and is independent of outside forces. Okay. So these are basically illustration of the fact that my definition of kinetic energy makes sense. Kinetic energy as a characteristic, a quantitative characteristic of the uh, moving object, which basically characterizes how much work we have to perform when uh, we have to change this motion in some way or another. But in this particular case, we were talking only about very specific kind of motion. It's a uniform um, motion along a straight line and the force acting exactly opposite to this to slow it down, right? So, um, there are two different things which I would like to pay attention to right now. First of all, we all understand that from the definition of work, uh, it follows that it's additive um, uh, characteristic of whatever we are performing. Because if I would like to do something, and then independently I would like to do something else, I perform certain amount of work here and certain amount of work here. And if I would like to accomplish this and this, I have to basically perform this and this and this the work is actually added together. It basically follows from the, from the definition of the, what is exactly the work. So you have one force maybe acting on one object, another acting on another object, both perform certain amount of work, and if you would like to achieve certain result, in both cases I have to spend basically both amounts of work and add them together. Which means work is additive which means that energy, kinetic energy, is additive. So, basically what I would like to say is the following. So, if I have n objects, now, each of them have certain amount of, certain mass, and each of them moves with certain speed. Now, kinetic energy of one particular object is this. Kinetic energy of the entire system of all the objects is this. It's sum of this i from 1 to n. So I'm, sum, I'm, I'm adding together energies, kinetic energies of each object, and then basically it gives me the kinetic energy of the entire system. <coughs> imagine, imagine, for instance, a, a room with molecules of air. Each molecule is moving in some chaotic uh, uh, direction, and each of them, at any given moment, has a certain speed uh, and, her, uh, and has a certain mass, so each molecule has certain kinetic energy. So kinetic energy which is concentrated in the entire room would be a sum of all these kinetic energies, which is a lot. Okay, so 
kinetic energy is additive and this is a kinetic energy of an entire system because again if I would like to do something with this entire system let's say slow down all these molecules to a state zero so they don't really move I have to spend amount of work to slow down each of them to zero which means I have to spend this amount of work on each molecule and that's why we are talking about the whole kinetic energy being an additive characteristic of the system of objects that's kind of obvious but I just wanted to, to tell about this another thing is well I'm talking about speed here not about velocity because I really don't really care about the direction of this because at any given moment we can say that the speed is a certain scalar now when uh, obviously there is a vector characteristic of this which is called velocity but it's not really part of this thing this is just a scalar value of of the speed which is important in this particular case because even if the uh, trajectory is some kind of a curve each particular in, uh, infinitesimal piece of that curve can be considered as a straight motion and basically uh, at that particular moment you can calculate what is the uh, kinetic energy of this particular um, object is and then as the speed actually is changing the kinetic energy is changing obviously now um, my last example is related to a little bit more again complicated case when instead of force acting exactly opposite to direction of the movement uh, let's say I'm um, trying to act at an angle now what happens in this particular case just let me exemplify it for instance um, uh, for instance I have a movement of this kind this is my object but the force acts at certain angle let's say it's maybe it's uh, some kind of a car which is moving and this is the force of the wind which is trying to kind of um, attack this car at a certain angle now what happens well obviously again the speed will change in some way or another I mean obviously depending on the um, uh, force of the of the wind it will change differently but however I would like to uh, basically again I would like to find out what happens if um, my force is acting a certain amount of time at angle to the speed what happens well again my final result should be that again it uh, doesn't really depend uh, on anything except the beginning and the ending um, mass and speed of the of this particular object so how the object would move, in, in move, would move in this particular case? Well, it will be this, probably, kind of a trajectory, right? When the force move, when the force acts this way, and the object moves this way, then this would be probably something like a trajectory, right? Now, I'm talking about the um, uh, movement on the plane, obviously, whatever I'm doing right now on the plane can be transformed into a three-dimensional space so it doesn't really matter but let me do it in a two-dimensional case so let's consider I have x and y coordinates here and my initial vector is v along the x and zero along, along the y-axis all right so this is my vector of the uh, velocity in this case I'm talking about velocity uh, so this is my x component and this is my y component in the very beginning so this is some value and this is zero now let's consider that during certain time t now let's say t is given in this particular case the force acts at certain angle which means I have vector which has coordinates like this so this particular force can be represented as fx and fy 
these are two vectors, these are two scalars which have the value of these, uh, of the magnitude of these two vectors, right? So that's basically what it is. Now, the fx component acting during the time t would force the uh, object uh, to change its speed along the x coordinate and fy would be uh, acting against the y component, right? So my acceleration also will, will be a vector which is equal to fx divided by m fy divided by m. So this is my acceleration vector. This is acceleration along the x and this is acceleration along the y. Now, obviously, based on the time and based on the initial speeds along the x and y and based on acceleration along the x and y, I can find the distance, right? So, my fx would actually uh, drive uh, our object along the sx on the x-axis and that would be a certain amount of work which I can call wx. You see, again, forces are additive energy is additive, work is additive, that's why I'm basically dividing it in two parts. And the force which is acting along the y-axis will uh, act at the distance as y, and this would be amount of work which my force will spend along the x direction, this will be amount of work along the y direction, and uh, I will see if their sum is equal to change in the uh, kinetic energy of the uh, of the body of the of the subject. Now, in the beginning, kinetic energy was mv square divided by two. At the end, it will be correspondingly piece along the one x uh, uh, axis and piece along another axis. So there is an energy which is uh, which this particular object has in one direction and energy in, a, in another direction. So, now it's just plain arithmetic or algebra if you wish. Um, I know acceleration. I know the time. So, um, now we can find out the um, the distance. So Sx is equal to, now along the x my initial speed is v and acceleration is at square over 2 ax which is fx square, uh, sorry, fxt square divided by 2m, right? Fx divided by m is acceleration, so it's ax times time squared divided by 2. That's the formula from kinematics. This is the um, distance, my force, which is equal to fx, is acting along the horizontal x axis, right? Now my sy is equal to initial speed uh, along the y speed is 0, so I have only a y t square over 2 which is f y to m uh, t square okay what's next well what's next is that I have to compare sum of these, which is two amounts of work which my force spends in one direction and another direction, multiplying this and this and summing them together, and compare it with 
uh, the total amount of um, energy which was in the beginning and uh, the total amount of change of the kinetic energy between the beginning and the end. Now, in the beginning, uh, I have mv square over 2 and along the y-axis is 0. Uh, I mean, along the y-axis is, is 0, right? At the end, at the moment t, I will have, at the moment t, along the x-axis I will have m v uh, x t square over 2, where v x t is the horizontal speed at moment t. And my y direction energy is m v y t square. Let's put parentheses divided by 2. That's my energy. So, if I will subtract from the beginning, which is from the total energy of this, if I will subtract this, I have to actually have some of these. We just have to check if it, you know, if it works. Well, um, let's just try. Let's just try. So, what is my V x t? At moment t, my speed would be the initial moment in the horizontal, which is V, plus a t, right? a is f divided by m t. And my Vyt is equal to similar, except that my vertical direction is zero, so it will be just uh, f, fx, sorry, fy divided by mt. So, I have to calculate now this plus this and check if I will be, uh, if I will have the same as total amount of work. All right, let's check it out. Okay. All right, let's calculate this one. I know this, so I have to square it. So, energy along the x-axis would be equal to m divided by 2 and the speed at moment t square, which is v plus fx over mt square. Now, energy along the y direction at moment t is equal to m over 2 times uh, f y t uh, divided by m square. This is mass this is the speed square divided by 2. Okay, so if I will add them together and subtract my initial value of energy, what will be? So Ex at moment t plus Ey at moment t minus E uh, minus e, which is mv square, divided by 2, equals
Okay. Uh, m divided by 2 v squared plus 2 fxt divided by m plus fx squared t squared divided by m squared plus y m divided by 2 fy squared t squared divided by m squared minus uh, initial mv squared divided by 2 equals Okay, this goes against this one. M2 to M Fx. So it's Fxt, right? Plus uh, Fx squared T squared divided by 2M. M and M, 1M cancelled, 2 is remaining. And plus M over okay so that's also f y squared t squared divided by 2m right okay now let's say what happens here okay if i will multiply this times fx uh, by the way, I mix I miss V here. I'm sorry. Yes. V times Fx, right, yeah. I see something is wrong here. So here also I will have uh, sorry, here. Fine, so let's multiply this by Fx and this is by Fy and add them together what happens fx vt fx vt plus fx squared t squared 2m fx squared t squared 2m plus fy squared t squared 2m exactly the same thing so again the equality doesn't really depend on anything now this contains components of the force and this contains components of the force that's true but since they are the same on both sides, which means that regardless of what exactly this fx and fy are, uh, what's their direction relative to the trajectory, initial trajectory of our object, the resulting difference between kinetic energy in the beginning and at the end is exactly the same as amount of work force uh, which, which acts at the angle performs. And here what's very important, I was adding, I was using additive property of the energy and additive property of the work. I basically um, decided to represent my force F as two forces, Fx and Fy, each one separately doing something, each one separately performing a certain amount of work. And the result of this is the difference between the total uh, amount of kinetic energy. Well, that's it for today. Um, I do recommend you to read the, um, uh, the textual part of this lecture, which is basically the same thing. It's like a textbook, and it's on unizor.com. Um, and, uh, and then I will probably do some problems next time about kinetic energy. So thanks very much, and good luck.